Hi, my name is Thais Gibson and I'm the co-owner and creator of the Personal Development School. This is your daily breakthrough video and in this video I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal journey en route to becoming secure. So this is something that was requested by so many of you guys in Facebook comments, in YouTube comments, in emails sent to the school, um, in webinars, like all over the place. And it was definitely something I was probably putting off a little bit personally. Um, just full disclosure, um, I don't love sharing personal stuff too much like on this channel. I just like the whole intention is like to serve and to like have a channel where you guys can learn and grow and heal and to really make it about the people here, not like about me personally. Um, but I do see a lot of value uh, in terms of like how me sharing my journey, A, gives people probably a lot of hope because I will tell you some like more personal components of it. Um, and if I can heal and if I can become secure, you'll see that you can too. Um, and also, I, I think that there's just a lot of value in terms of like hearing the key takeaways and the things that, you know, if, if I'm sort of explaining out some of my journey, you might be able to be like, oh my gosh, that's something I'm stuck on and that worked for her. So, you know, I can, I can try that too. And so that's sort of how I'm going to structure this. Um, you know, I, again, like I'm not like the biggest center of attention person. I love sharing, like I can share stuff all day if it's about information I love or things I love to share. But when it's about personal stuff, I think as a child, I went through, um, it's like not actually a bad thing, but when I was a kid, I was Nala in the Lion King in third grade in the school play. And I like fully forgot all of my lines um, just on the stage in front of like all the parents, all the teachers, all the kids, like everybody and just like froze. Um, and so I think ever since then, I'm like, oh no, center of attention. I'm also an INFJ if that gives any context. Um, so I'm facing my own fear here today with you guys. Um, and I've never really worked on it. So this is a great opportunity for me to do just that. Um, okay. So, so I will say one quick thing as a disclaimer, this is me sharing. So while there will be like key takeaways and there will be things that hopefully you can take away from, um, the, the challenges and sort of the turning points in my journey, um, you know, it, it's not one size fits all. This is according to my personal experience. And so I just want to be clear about that. So, from the very beginning, if we like really start at the beginning, and I'm not going to go into too much detail anywhere, but I would say I definitely had like a really chaotic personal life um, all through like early childhood, grade school, high school. Um, and I would say if there was like a checklist of like major traumas that you can go through as a person, I went through a lot of those, um, a lot, a lot. And so I definitely, and I was also for sure like a very sensitive child. Um, and I took in everything and I really sponged in everybody's emotions and feelings. And I think I kind of just took in and took on a lot of the chaos that was happening around me and I didn't have an outlet for it. And, um, I was also a, a very competitive athlete. So I was playing soccer and my whole goal was like, you know, as I, I grew up in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and my whole goal was like, get a, a soccer scholarship to the US, go to America and play sports and, and all that stuff. So in my one of my major like scouting years, um, I had a really severe knee injury and was on crutches for eight weeks. It was like a no weight bearing recovery. Um, and so I ended up being in a position where that was like, it just sparked all these things for me. It was like, oh my gosh, my dreams are being taken away. What if I can't recover? Um, and from that point, I became addicted to my painkillers. And I also developed a severe eating disorder. I was like super struggling with bulimia for quite a while. Um, and it's interesting because there was all this chaos in my life, but there were some like really beautiful things happening too, like lots of support coming in from other ways and, and um, just lots of blessings and, and lots of pain. So it was kind of this like strange dualistic um, upbringing I had with like all these extremes in it to a certain degree. And, um, and I think that's part of probably why I like relate so much to all people is because I've known what it's like to sort of be in, in all places um, in terms of suffering and in terms of um, healing and feeling healed and, and blessed. So anyway, so basically that, so this was right before my 15th birthday and this started this big downward spiral. Now 
at that time I had been in like little dating relationships and little like surface sort of dating things. And for sure, I already had a lot of like fearful avoidant tendencies. Um, I would also say that I probably had some CPTSD symptoms, like almost textbook. Um, and even though that wasn't something that was like fully addressed or discussed at the time, like that's a relatively new, it's not even in the DSM yet. Right. So, um, so there were definitely some components for myself where I showed a lot of those, um, symptoms and characteristics and already had like a lot of sort of challenges that I was probably bringing in, which I'm sure is the reason that I was struggling with addiction and an eating disorder in the first place. Um, but anyway, so, so basically what happened is I would tell myself this story and I'd be like, I'm going to get a soccer scholarship. I'm going to find my way back to getting this and I'm going to, um, I'm going to heal once I'm like starting a new life. And so I would tell myself this story all the time. And of course, that's not how it goes. It usually goes, it, it got a lot worse for me um, when I kind of went, went off on my own. And um, so I was, and, and I was in a pretty serious relationship when I went to school. Um, I, I dated somebody pretty seriously for five years who was also, for the better part of five years, who was also struggling with addiction. Um, and that was a really tumultuous relationship, like lots of fighting, a really good person. I think somebody who meant well and same with myself, like, like both very caring people, but just a lot of like emotional chaos and not knowing how to process stuff. And um, I was definitely super fearful avoidant at this time and definitely had some major trust issues, um, just a lot of major challenges, like basically everything that I talk about and like, here are the characteristics of the fearful avoidant video. Like that was me nine out of 10 on almost everything, if not 10 out of 10. Um, and so relationships were very hard. I remember thinking I always like did better in life when I was just out of a relationship because I could kind of like focus and I wasn't being so pulled away by all the feelings. And I was probably fearful of what I'm leaning anxious as well, um, at least in this specific relationship. So um, basically what happened to me from that point, and again, I won't go into all these details, but I went through like a severe rock bottom in my life um like severe severe rock bottom and was really struggling and um i ended up like taking a break from school going back to school somehow and um i was like fairly high functioning during addiction and eating disorder most of the time and um and basically when i went back to school i was like in one of my classes and i remember leaving and this person coming out and it, i think we had like a break or something and he was like, are you leaving? Like, are you going home from, from class? It was like a big three hour class that I would take every Friday. And I was like packing up my stuff to leave like permanently. And, and I said like, yeah, I can't like, I've got too much going on in my life. And there was a lot of stuff happening and um, I can't like, I just, I think I have to like leave school. I, I don't know if I can do this. And anyways, I somehow got into this conversation and he said to me in passing, something about how your subconscious mind always wins against your conscious mind. Your conscious mind cannot outwill or overpower your subconscious mind. And as somebody, if anybody has ever gone through addiction or an eating disorder, like I think one of the, the hardest things about that is the amount of self-loathing, number one. And number two, just like feeling like you always lose this battle to yourself. Because I would spend every day being like, this is the last time I'm going to do drugs. This is the last time I'm going to make myself throw up. This is, and every day I would lose this battle to myself and feel so defeated after it would happen, like just so defeated. And I used to tell myself in these moments, like if I ever get out of this, if I ever can stop this horribly painful cycle, I will do anything I can with my whole life to make sure other people don't feel as alone as I do right now and as helpless as I do right now. And I'm sure that's part of why here's the personal development school and here's the work I do for a living. Um, so that's probably like the reason. Anyways, so, so, um, that was a really hard thing. And when he said that to me, he didn't know this, but this explained everything. This explained to me why, like, I would lose this battle to myself is that my conscious mind would set a certain set of intentions and my subconscious mind um, would have a whole bunch of different dynamics and interests at play. So 
Um, this was like a huge breakthrough in my personal life. And this set me on like a full track of like, I'm going to learn anything and everything I can about the subconscious mind, because I know this is going to be what heals me. And like, I honestly truly believed at the time, like I, like, I can't live like this forever. And this is going to be what saves my life. And so I treated this work and, and this learning, like, this is going to be what saves my life. Like I would pour into everything and all of my spare time, like reading and listening to videos and anything I could find about like what was making sense here. So that was a huge number one turning point. Um, and then I really got into a lot of like spiritual things as well. Not like with any particular religious affiliation or anything like that, but I got really into meditation and something that was so powerful for me about meditation is that I knew I was observing my own mind. And by the way, up before this, I was also diagnosed. So I was in, in therapy when I was in my late teens. Um, and I was on antidepressants. I was diagnosed with, um, depression, anxiety, an eating disorder, substance abuse issues. And, um, and nothing else, but looking back now, I'm like, oh my gosh, I definitely was struggling with a lot of CPTSD stuff, but that's its own story. So, um, so basically, um, I went through this whole, like nothing had worked. I felt like nothing had worked. I, I tried rehab as well. I don't know if I mentioned that already and I didn't stay for very long, but I was like, this stuff like, isn't explaining to me why I'm like losing this war with myself. So when I came across meditation and I started learning about meditation, I realized that one of the most important things that came from it is that I could observe my own mind. I could observe my own thought patterns. And what I found is that my thought patterns, and this is what I was, so I was meditating three or four hours a day. I was like, I'm going to heal. I'm going to find a way. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick of having a tremendous amount of pain in my relationships it was like suffering to live every day. Um, like I just felt like I was in torment. And, and so I was like, so I love the idea too, at the time of like enlightenment and it's sort of like a Buddhism, Buddhist ideal. And, um, for a period of time, I thought I was going to go like live in an ashram and, and all of that stuff. Um, but I just love the idea of like being free of suffering. And so I was on a quest for a while to like understand everything I can about the mind and about how we can um, undo the parts of ourselves that are causing pain. But also as somebody who wasn't raised around religion and, and um, didn't have like a really like religious foundation or, or context for things, um, I really needed to understand like the scientific side of things. So I would like learn about like the ego mind from a spiritual perspective and like what that means and how that functions. And then I would learn about like, what does that really mean from like a psychological context? And keep in mind, like I was in school for psychology and all this stuff at the same time. So I was trying to bridge like these kind of worlds between spirituality, psychology, and science, and sort of trying to find like where everything would overlap and like neurochemistry and neuroplasticity. And I just poured into things for, for quite some time around this. So, um, I feel like this is becoming a very long video already. Um, so basically <laughs> I went through this whole journey, um, meditating hours a day, learning so much, um, and this is what healed me. This is, I started to see these like very quick results with healing and being able to be sober and live a sober life and like not feeling like I was suffering and having this whole like vision of something to move towards. So all these beautiful things started taking place. Um, my life also, I kept having like these synchronicities with learning, like, like somebody would talk about boundaries and then I would, you know, be in a bookstore and like, like a book of on boundaries would like, you know, be right there in front of me after I had a conversation two minutes ago, but like just lots of little things. So I, I was really like motivated and I'm sure my reticular activating system in my brain was putting all of its energy into like focusing on psychology and healing and, and all these different things. So some key things that really helped me. Okay. Um, number one, understanding the subconscious mind. And I will say this time and time again, if we do not engage the subconscious mind in our process of transformation, you can like change a little for a short period of time, but ultimately the subconscious mind will always bring you back to your patterns. And so we have to use the principles of subconscious reprogramming, like repetition and emotion, um, to really create 
healed dynamics. Number two, meditation was so powerful for me because I would sit and I would observe. I would close my eyes, meditate, notice the types of thought patterns that would come up for me. And, you know, CBT, there's a lot of amazing things that teach this, but CBT being one of them, um, which I was learning at the time, doing like a certification in, um, but also like Byron Katie's The Work. There's so many places that teach you this, um, but there's a lot of like information out there that teaches you to question your thinking and to not just believe. And something I noticed and remember noticing very profoundly is like, I felt like my internal dialogue when I started to observe it literally was like a representation of all of my pain and traumas. And it was like the narration of that. Like if I had, um, if I felt, you know, criticized growing up, it was like, I had taken that criticism and I had become that person or, you know, that voice in the relationship to myself. If I had felt unsafe in different life experiences, there I was like going through my life, telling myself how all these bad things are going to happen and how, you know, all these things, if I had broken trust, um, if somebody or people broke trust in my life, here I was like telling myself all the time to be suspicious. You can't trust breaking the trust and relationship to myself. Um, and just all these things. So I realized like, wow, my internal dialogue is like largely made up of, um, it's focal points. Like the voice in my mind is largely, um, all about, these different like dynamics that are taking place or have taken place in the past that I'm like reprojecting and re-narrating in the future. And, um, you know, this is a lot of what I dove into learning about the subconscious and CBT and NLP and how these things work and where they come from. And, and so that was really powerful for me. And I know I teach that a lot here on the channel, so it might not be that new. Um, and then I want to share a really important story. So I got mostly sober, but I was still drinking. And I was back in school. I was also working. And I was like, you know, my life had taken this major turn for good at a point. And this is about a year after pouring myself into all this stuff and meditating a lot. And, and I remember that I would go to school early, go to work in the afternoon and evening, and then come back and I lived in the U.S. still at the time, and I and they sell wine at gas stations in the U.S., which they don't in Canada. Um, and I remember I would always pick up a bottle of wine at a gas station directly across from this condo building where I lived or apartment building where I lived. And I would go and I would get a bottle of wine, and I couldn't open the bottle of wine and not drink the whole thing. And this is like on a Tuesday night. I'm like living by myself, like you know, like nobody needs to be drinking a bottle of wine. And, and I would get so stressed out about it. I'd be like, oh my gosh, you're going to go backwards in your life. Like you've come so far and you're, you're like still showing symptoms of being an addict. You're going to go backwards. Look, you're ruining everything. Like you're going to ruin everything you've, you've been trying to build and you're getting back on track and you're going to ruin Like I would tell, like really terrorize myself in my thinking. And sure enough, then I would go and go buy another bottle of wine or go to the bar and get a drink. And, and, you know, and so I was like in this cycle where I noticed that I would beat myself up and it would make me want to escape myself more. And at one point I was like, okay, actually at one point I read a line in a book and it was a Wayne Dyer book. And he said, it's better to be for a solution than against a problem. And then I read another quote very synchronistically like that same day or something. And it was by Buckminster Fuller. And he said, if you want to change the existing paradigm, what you have to do is create, and, and this isn't verbatim of the quote, but he basically said, what you do is you create a new paradigm and ignore the old one until it becomes obsolete. And I was also like learning a little bit about like neuroplasticity and reading some books on that stuff. And learning about how neural pathways atrophy over time when you stop feeding them. And when you keep firing and wiring new ones, they strengthen. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm beating myself up and I'm recreating the exact wounds that I'm trying, that are probably what caused addiction for me in the first place. Like having painful internal dialogue and then, you know, our beliefs and thoughts create emotions. Emotions are made up of neurochemistry and neurochemical reactions, right? And then we have chemical imbalances, right? Because we're thinking all these really painful thoughts or we have these really painful beliefs. And here I am like recreating that. And of course I wanna keep drinking and, and numbing. And so that was this really like, so all I did was practice every single day. I'd be like, I'm just not gonna beat myself up. I'm just gonna be like so kind in the relationship to myself. 
And I'm going to like, just look at how far I've come and how much I'm learning and growing and how much hope there is, because look at how, you know, I was able to stop taking painkillers and I'm just going to do that. And within two, three weeks, I was able to literally get a bottle of wine. And I'm not, this is why I say this is not me giving advice. This is me not like, I just want to be really clear. If you're struggling with addiction, this isn't me saying like, you can be that this way and do this. I'm literally just sharing my story. Um, I was able to then get a bottle of wine, drink a glass of wine and stop drinking. And I did go through like a full, like very sober period of life after I think for like four or five years, I didn't really drink at all, like nothing. Um, and, and so I, and so I'm not like abstinence and like the 12 steps and all that stuff is so important for so many people. And I'm not saying to do this just to be really clear. I'm not sure if I should have said that story now. I'm like, oh, just to be super clear, um, please follow like whatever programs or protocols you're doing. If you are struggling personally with addiction. Um, and at the same time, you can do this supplementary work to like rewire your internal dialogue and your thinking, your, your, your internal dialogue and your thought patterns are the same thing, just so you know. Um, so, so anyway, so that was like a really pivotal moment and, and the less I guilted myself, shamed myself, the better. And that was really important. So then, um, some other really important things that came up for me, just in terms of lessons. Um, number one, I learned that whatever I felt like I was missing, and I say this on the channel too, in my life is, was like what I had to give to myself. So if I was missing emotional support, how am I going to emotionally support myself? What would I have wanted that to look like from other people? How can I give that to myself? If I was missing, um, feeling safe, great. Then like, how am I going to make myself feel safe? Like I, and I would look at the very specific things and then try to give those things to myself. And that was me like filling my unmet needs, right. And ending the re-traumatization cycle that we often put ourselves through when we have unmet needs. And then we keep them unmet because we have an A, realize that we have them or B, we have no idea how to meet them. And so I did some research into that and I encourage you guys to do that too. And, and like all of our needs courses in the school are specifically oriented towards that. Um, so super aware of my thoughts, um, super aware of my unmet needs and giving those things to myself, learn to have empathy for myself. I was somebody who was out there like empathizing with everybody else and feeling for everybody else's feelings and not making any space for myself. And so if I made a mistake, it would be like, oh gosh, like, and what I learned to do is be like, no, 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 I'm a human. It's okay to make mistakes. I went through some stuff that led me here and pain doesn't solve pain. Like it's only going to create more pain. Um, so that was really important. And, you know, I could go way into that, but that's a hugely important part of anybody's road to healing. And I'm going to get into some of the attachment oriented stuff in just a second. Um, I did a lot of work on forgiveness. I think that when we hold, like there's that Nelson Mandela quote about when you are carrying resentment, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Like, we don't realize how much a lack of forgiveness spills into everything else in our life. I used to be like the queen of holding grudges and, you know, could hold on to things for so long, like these little minute details. And that was poisoning me. Like that was so, I feel so light and free. And I think back to how I used to act and feel then. And like, that was a hard thing I put myself through, like not knowing how to forgive, thinking that it was like strong to hold on to things instead of realizing like actually the emotional lack of strength I was exhibiting to myself and the pain I was putting myself through. And so like I can go into forgiveness for a long time and how to properly forgive. And we've got a course in the school for that in a lot of detail. Um, but what I want you to recognize is like, I guess as an analogy, if somebody is not forgiving somebody else, like let's say I'm sitting here holding on to a grudge, you know, chances are that person's like out, like in the grocery store, doing their life, having a good old time with their life. And like, here I am like thinking thoughts that are hurting me, creating feelings from thinking thoughts that are hurting me, having anger rushing through my body and my physiology at a neurochemical level, increasing my cortisol levels. And then the more we hold on to things, the more we reproject their likelihood out onto the external world. And so then we get into a position where we're like, 
oh, because that person did this to me, this person's going to hurt me. And we block ourselves from receiving love, from receiving healthy relationships, from receiving connection. We fear connection. We, we don't know how to trust. We over anger in, in relationship to things and, and everything falls apart. So forgiveness is a huge, huge part of healing um, as well as compassion to yourself, as I was mentioning. Um, now, another really important thing. So I guess like from that point, um, I started to heal a lot personally. And, um, and, at, but, and at this time I'm like in school and I did like a whole bunch of, um, so I did a master's degree in, in transpersonal psychology. I did a whole bunch of different certifications and like CBT, NLP. I was trying to like put everything together that was happening for me. And, um, and then I, so I was out of a really long-term relationship. And then I spent about four years of my life, like fully, fully single, um, did not go on a date did not do anything except focus on the relationship to myself. And that was like one of the like more magical times of my life, like just beautiful. Like I, I had never done that or had that experience. And so to be able to focus on my own healing and my own space, like that is something I think when people are going through recovery or when people are trying to get in relationship to themselves, yes, it feels weird at first. Yes. You have to go through this period of time where it's like, I'm alone in the world. They're like, what, what's happening? Like, this is so scary. Um, and that as you settle into that and you learn to have that and you learn to self soothe and you learn to self connect and you learn to have intimacy in the relationship to yourself. Meaning like if, if you felt like you had emotional intimacy with somebody outside of you, you would probably feel that way because people are listening to your feelings People are making space to be present with you. People are hearing your needs. People are respecting your boundaries and honoring them. People are asking you questions about yourself and actively trying to get to know you. And so how can we give those things to ourselves? And I think when we learn to have like a foundational relationship with ourselves, this is one of the biggest things that will stop you from fearing disconnection outside of yourself, because at the end of the day, you know that you can rely on yourself and you know that you can connect to yourself. And so for anybody who's watching this and feeling like, cause I was probably like FA leaning anxious, um, for most of my relationships, sometimes leaning avoidant, but very FA that's for sure. One time leaning avoidant, maybe twice, but then mostly anxious. So, so, um, in, in one relationship is what I'm saying. Cause sometimes I'm sure most of you know who are watching this, you can get polarized one way or the other, depending on who you're with. Right. Um, so in the stage of your life as well. So, um, so basically like, I think when, when you learn that it really takes away a lot of the fear of being disconnected, a lot of the fear of loss, these sorts of things. So anyway, so I went through that really intense healing period, did a ton of work on myself, did a ton of education and learning. And then, um, soon after that started my practice, um, started giving workshops and talks and all these things and got very busy work-wise very fast and very unexpectedly. Um, and then got into the relationship I'm in now, which I've been in for years. Um, and it's a very, very healthy, thriving, safe, like peaceful, <laughs> really nice relationship, which if you ask me growing up, like, I didn't even understand um, that that was like a, a possibility. Um, and one thing I feel so much about the relationship I've been in now is that it's like a, a secure landing base. You know how when when people talk about attachment theory and like a, original like John Bowlby's work, he talks about how like your attachment figure in a securely attached relationship feels like a safe base to like go off into the world from and do things from. And I think when we have that, we do accomplish more. We do, you know, have more support and you can sort of put your heads together on things. And, and I think that that's like a really beautiful um, experience to have and, and hopefully what people can go after and, and work through. And I fully, fully trust the person I'm in a relationship with, which, um, I wouldn't have thought was possible either, quite honestly. Um, so, so all of these things are really possible and I'm definitely not sitting here. I'm going to tell you the attachment theory, attachment side of healing in just a second still too. Um, but I just, I think we get a lot of like misinformation um, in different places and, and in different messaging. And, and sometimes I've heard people say like, oh, if you're fearful avoidant, I know it says in the book attached, like 
you basically can't heal this attachment style. I could not disagree with that statement more. Like you absolutely can. You have to engage your subconscious mind in the process. You need tools and learning that's actually going to um, help you work at the subconscious level. And with that, absolutely change is possible. So I, cause trust me, I was getting into like very not healthy fights and dynamics and all kinds of stuff, um, you know, in my late teens, early twenties and, and if I can <laughs> become secure, anybody else can, I promise you. So, but you need to do work. Like it's not uh, an overnight, like push the, the magic button and that's it. It's like repatterning means like repetition and emotion of new thoughts, new feelings, new ways of perceiving, reprogramming your beliefs. And then as I, so I did all this healing work and I had done a lot of like learning, but then there's always some like learning that is specific to a relationship. And so one of the things I think the, the, the partner I have now, um, who was originally dismissive avoidant, and he would also done a, a good bit of work on himself um, prior to us meeting. But um, one of the things that the lessons that he really brought to me is the importance of ex communicating every need because there still was like a little bit, like I hadn't worked specifically on my attachment style and like my beliefs about relationships because I had been really on my own. Um, and I hadn't done like any attachment theory work or, or, um, courses or anything like that yet. And so this was like kind of its own new layer of, of healing and understanding. And while I had done so much reprogramming on myself, it had washed away, like probably 80% of the pain that I was going to go through. There were still little things for me to notice. And one of the big things that I had to still work on, um, was, expressing my needs and showing up for my boundaries and being like, I need this specific thing. And that was an, a really important part of becoming secure. And I think sometimes we think, oh, like, you know, especially as a fearful avoidant, I would be so hyper vigilant and so good at seeing somebody else's needs and understanding their needs. And often at the expense of my own needs, right. And often like feeling like it's safe to put myself on the back burner and cope with everything in front of me. And so, um, that was really powerful and learning to communicate my needs all the time and seeing them through. And if somebody forgets to remind, to remind this person and to say, Hey, this is really important to me and, and, and set boundaries around that stuff. Like if this isn't something that you can um, show up for, then like, I need to know that because I want to be in a relationship where I feel like my needs can be met. And every time I would like put things out on the table and have those tough conversations and be like, look, this here is a problem. And like, I respect myself enough to say this specific need not being met could be a deal breaker. And like, we need to address it. This person will always rise to the occasion and like show up 110%, sometimes forget things, but always try so hard. And, and so even if there are little moments of forgetfulness that was seen through and, and transformed and I'm not saying that that's going to be everybody's experience. I think one of the unique things about the dismissive avoidant person that I'm with is, um, and he's now very secure. So I feel almost badly saying the dismissive avoidant person because that's not who he is. Um, but but one of the unique things is that he always tried. And, and I've seen so many couples in my practice over the years and worked with so many people in that context. And if somebody's not trying, then it's, it's very difficult for it to work, um, if not impossible. But if you have two people who are willing to show up and have the tough conversations and communicate honestly and vulnerably, then things can absolutely change. So that's that. The last thing I will say is um, that, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, but the last thing that I wanted to make a note of saying is that I learned to communicate very vulnerably as well. So I learned to say, hey, I feel afraid, or I feel uncomfortable with this thing, or hey, when that situation happened a minute ago, I like felt some jealousy come up for me, or insecurity, or um, I'm afraid of losing trust, or, you know, and, and that is a very scary thing when you're going through that as a fearful avoidant, because I think we build a lot of our identity originally, and the same goes for DAs and AAs. Um, but you build a lot of your identity around like protect myself, like be safe in the world, navigate, like, and a big part of my 
personality. And I know that most of you will listen to this and be like, oh yeah, right. But a big part of my personality is I would over protect myself. So, you know, if I felt like somebody was um, attacking me and not that people were like necessarily attacking, if somebody like cut me off driving, like if I felt there was an attack, um, emotionally or whatever, um, I was over defending. Cause I, I think I grew up feeling like I had to over defend and, and show up for myself and all these different things. And so, you know, to, to communicate and to say, I'm afraid or things like this is a very scary thing, but it's not just a beneficial thing for your relationship. It's part of your healing as a person because emotional literacy and learning to put your your feelings and your needs into words and share them with others is part of the the healing that needs to be done for you to become securely attached. And so if somebody doesn't respond perfectly, that's less relevant than you doing that work in the first place. If somebody doesn't respond well, or you you don't have somebody who's willing to do the same thing, or there's not a back and forth, then then it probably isn't the right relationship for you if, if it feels unfulfilling in that way. But you'll eventually have people in your life that do do that and do bring that to the table. And so what I would say now is as I've done that work over, you know, years and years now, it's been a while. (laughs) Um, But I've I would say the people closest to me in my life right now are, you know, I have a great relationship with all my close family members um, and and loving friends and people I work with and business partners and um, obviously my romantic partner. And, and so like all of these things happen because I sometimes would disconnect from people who weren't able to bring the same quality of connection to a relationship, who didn't want to have the tough conversations, who didn't want to do the work or be vulnerable or get close in that way. And, and eventually over time, you develop this very a specific group of people in your life who show up the same way you do. And it's extremely powerful and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but it is a process and you'll see like which friends or people in your life in general, like are able to show up that way, but then you can really nourish those relationships and appreciate them and, and, um, feel really supported in a unique way because of that. So that would be my story. <laughs> um, for those of you as well that asked, I my teeth have crowns on them. Um, I had extreme tooth sensitivity and like pain, I think from um, being bulimic and, and going through a lot of the drug issues and it ruined the enamel on my teeth. So like anything hot, cold for years, um, sometimes even like breathing would hurt. Anyways, um, so for those of you who asked about that and are curious about that personally, um, that is also a change. Um, and, and what I would say is as a human, and it's very happy because now I have no friggin' tooth pain and, um, I would have had to like get braces or something I didn't get growing up anyways. Um, so that is done, but, um, what I would say, and I guess the message I want to leave everybody with, if you stayed to the end of this long story is that change is completely possible. And it starts with the change in the relationship to yourself. Because if we just try to do it only exclusively outside of ourselves, and we've, if we don't like learn to do the reprogramming and healing of our subconscious mind, if we don't learn to like be able to feel safe and okay sitting with ourselves, I still meditate twice a day, every day. Um, I'll do like 10 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. I'm not doing like four hours a day anymore or three hours a day. Um, but but if we don't learn to be able to sit with ourselves, process our own feelings effectively, know what our needs and boundaries are, then, then it's very hard to have fulfilling relationships outside of us. But if we can give that gift to ourselves, everything else gets a lot easier. So not only do your relationships get easier, and then you have nicer, more fulfilling, thriving relationships, but you are clear about what you want to do with your career. You are clear about your patterns with money. Um, you know, something that I think is important too, is like when we want to gain successes in life or build things or create things for our lives, it's really hard to do that when a lot of our internal dialogue is distracted by pain. And maybe I was a more extreme version of that, but 
you know, I spend a lot of time throughout the day thinking like this person wronged me, this thing is wrong. Why did the teacher do this? Why did that person? And a lot of my internal dialogue all day was really consumed by like negative thoughts. How can you be living like that? And then think about like building a career and have creative ideas and have plans for your future. And, and you know, like you can't, you can, sorry, I don't wanna say you can't if like somebody's in that, cause that's not true. You can, of course, but like you can't to the degree that it would be possible for you without that, right? So like career, financial, mental, emotional, like I literally as a human being feel peace on a daily basis, like peace and gratitude. And I wake up in the morning and I'm like excited for the day. Um, so, you know, things flow and things happen. And I, I think we don't get a lot of tools like this that say like, here are some things you can do to really heal and like reprogram and create. And, and um, so that's what the personal development school is here to do. That's what this YouTube channel is here to do. Um, and when you give that gift to yourself, everything else opens up and, and all of like feeling in peace and feeling happy and having thriving relationships and all that stuff is completely, completely possible. Um, so change starts with a relationship to yourself first. It's so important to learn to be kind to ourselves and not reenact the punishment reward system in the relationship to ourselves. And I think that's everything that I'm going to say. <laughs> so if you stay till the end, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for listening to me. I hope I shared enough and I was open and vulnerable enough. Um, and if there's anything you want to know or you want to see more of, as long as I know that it's like serving and helping and making a difference for you guys, I am willing to go outside of my comfort zone at any moment in time um, to do that. So thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.